Okay, well, good morning, everybody. Uh, this is James Corliss. I'm the Director of Transportation for America. Uh, first off, I just want to apologize for the delay in our start time. Uh, I think you'll, um, you'll understand once we explain. We've got, a, we've got a pretty darn good excuse. This is not the dog ate my homework. Uh, this is <clears throat> welcome to the first um, sort of chaotic four days of a new administration, and we're Obviously, very sorry. Uh, I think I think probably most of you know um, Pete Stefanos from Federal Highway Administration is not able to join us this morning. Um, but we wanted to go ahead with this presentation with Beth Osborne, our senior policy advisor at T for America, but also somebody who ser served in uh, the U.S. Department of Transportation was very active in this rulemaking and probably one of the best experts that we know. Um, so uh, again, I'm going to actually just kick this off and turn it over. <clears throat> You'll, um, um, Beth is going to walk you through. We wanted to go forward with this this morning because uh, we do think, I think if you followed T4 over the last few years, you know how important we think this rulemaking is. Uh, we wanted to really dig into the details of what just happened uh, a couple of weeks ago uh, with the last set of, uh, of rules that came out uh, from USDOT, what those rules mean, um, how they're going to be implemented, who they affect, uh, and also um, what, what really lies ahead in terms of just the next couple of weeks and months. Um, there is a, a freeze on rulemaking uh, from the Trump administration, one of the reasons that uh, Pete Stefanos couldn't join it this morning. But again, so much really important information that we wanted to share with you uh, what, on what is in the, the PM2, PM3 rules. So I'm going to turn it over to Beth. Uh, I'm also going to leave uh, you in the capable hands of Renata Reeder and other folks on our team uh, to facilitate questions and Q&A. Again, our apologies for the delay, uh, but we, uh, we wanted to proceed. And Beth, over to you. Well, good morning, everybody. Thanks, James. And uh, again, I do want to apologize for us being late. Uh, originally, this was going to be a presentation. Uh, by me and uh, Pete Stefanos, who is the head of performance management for Federal Highways. But those of you reading the paper this morning may have learned that uh, the, the new administration has put a freeze on new rulemakings. And part of that freeze, which is typical at the, new, at the beginning of a new administration for them to get their arms around um, uh, rulemakings that are new or underway, uh, is they stop communications about them while they're making determinations about uh, what will be done. Um, one of the things that an executive order did yesterday is it delayed the implementation of recently uh, passed rules by 60 days. Uh, as we walk through this and the implementation schedule, you will find that that doesn't really do a lot to this rule. Um, but as a result, uh, for the next uh, couple of months, the folks at Federal Highways and other federal agencies will not be able to do a lot of outreach uh, on where their agencies stand on the rules and what's going on. So you're going to have to just do with only me today. Um, so let's go ahead and just jump right into this. Um, so to remind folks of what we're talking about, MAP 21, the reauthorization bill that uh, was, was just a two-year extension of federal programs included uh, a list of performance measures. It gave states and MPOs a lot more flexibility on how federal dollars could be spent, but in exchange it required performance management. And if you look, a lot of you may have heard me say this before, if you look at MAP 21's legislative language, you will see that the performance management uh, section is actually very brief and to the point, quite, quite clear and simple. It's less than two pages long. Um, but then implementing it turned out to be a, a lot more of a challenging task than, than I think we initially expected. So FHWA, decided, the Federal Highway Administration decided to divide the rules up into three groupings, which I have represented on the slide uh, currently before you. The first one, the, the performance management one rule, was the basic safety rules, fatalities, serious injuries, fatality rate, serious injuries rate, and then uh, what was not initially included in MAP 21, but was added by an appropriations bill a year later, was a specific uh, look at bike peg fatalities, because one of the things that both advocates and members of Congress pointed out was that many of the things that engineers currently do to make roads safer for drivers actually make them less safe for bicyclists and pedestrians. So you could see 
a, a suite of safety measures that are uh, addressing overall safety while sacrificing one group. So that was added to the PM1 rule. Uh, the, the PM2 rule is pavement conditions on the National Highway System and interstate and uh, National Highway System bridge conditions. That was made final the same day as the PM3 measure, which had traffic congestion, on-road mobile source emissions, freight movement on the interstate, and performance of the interstate system and the NHS. The focus of this presentation is going to be almost entirely on the, the PM3 rule. Uh, the PM2 rule did not have a lot of changes in it, and, and we did not have a lot of comments on it either. Um, there were some minor adjustments to data collection requirements and uh, pavement condition thresholds, but really it, was, it, it came out in the end very much like it was proposed. Moving on to the next slide, um, this gives you a sense of all the different rulemakings that actually have gone on over the last several years that implicate performance management to set it up. It's not just the, the safety performance measures, the highway safety improvement, uh, or uh, sorry, the, the safety performance measures, the condition performance measures, the system performance measures. It's also the planning rule. It's also the asset management rule. It's also the, the highway safety improvement program rule. And this is not even complete because what it doesn't show is, it's moving on to the next uh, slide, uh, it doesn't show the FTA, the Federal Transit Administration measures on safety and state of repair, or the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration measures, which digs much deeper into specific safety measures. Uh, they will be collaborating with the highway safety offices in each of the states to measure particular areas of safety, and I've listed a handful of them here, unrestrained fatalities, child safety restraints, unhelmeted motorcycle fatalities, speeding, et cetera. Um, so that's the background. I, I do want to also mention, going on to the next slide, that uh, these are not comprehensive measures that Congress put forward. This is what Congress could agree to. It is meant to be a floor, not a ceiling. The expectation is that states and MPOs will add their own priorities that go beyond this. Um, and, and if you move on to the next slide, there is a, a demonstration of several of the sorts of measures that were not included that many areas are considering right now. Uh, which is access to opportunity. That's access to jobs and education and training and uh, child care and health care and such stuff like that. Um, public health, economic activity, freight movement off of the interstates. One of the things that's very interesting about the, what MAP 21 required for freight movement is it's only asking DOTs and MPOs to look at freight movements on the interstates in spite of the fact that there has never been a delivery of freight that starts or ends on an interstate. But that's all that the law expects us to look at. Uh, also missing stormwater, transportation costs, reliability of transit, walkability, bikeability. So uh, there's a lot that's still on the table that states and MPOs uh, might be considering adding on to the federal standards, and I will say one of the reasons it's important to do that is we address what we measure. And if you, if, if someone asked you to sit down and write your area priorities down, and you wrote out five priorities, four of which, three of which is included in the federal rulemaking, and two of which are not, you will skew your results quite uh, to an extreme level if you only measure the three that the feds asked you to. So it's extremely important to think about whether or not you're serving your constituents by only doing the bare minimum that the feds have asked. Um, and, and to make that case a little bit more, going on to the next slide, um, one of the things that I point out is while we're measuring congestion a lot, we're not measuring what makes an area successful. So the lower picture is uncongested and the upper picture is congested. Which, which is the roadway you want to bring into your community in order to, to you know, fund infrastructure, to create jobs? Which do you think is the job maker? Which is the place maker? Which is going to attract talent? Going on to the next slide is another great example. Um, in fact, the one in the lower left corner is in Rochester and is currently filled in because it has been such a blight on the community, but it is completely 
uncongested. That picture was taken midday. It is not closed. It is open to traffic. Um, but if we're only looking at congestion and not thinking about the stuff we really mean by congestion, the true bottlenecks that stymie a community versus free flow all the time, then we would be uh, putting our thumb on the scale in favor of the wide open unused area versus the area where everyone is trying desperately to get to. Um, moving on, uh, we asked for several changes to the uh, performance measure rule that addresses system performance. We ask that FHWA focus on people, not vehicles. We wanted multimodal measures. We wanted to account for all people using the system. We wanted them to measure uh, not just mobile source emissions, but carbon dioxide. We wanted uh, to measure access to destinations and connectivity, or at least give some guidance to those who are interested in doing that, recognizing that the federal government couldn't mandate that because it wasn't in MAP 21, they could give some guidance to those interested in it. And support innovative things that states and metro areas are already doing. Um, we had gone through a very large campaign on uh, pointing out that how we measure congestion matters. That uh, a road that is only moving single occupancy vehicles is not the same as a road that moves lots of people in lots of different ways through encouraging uh, transit use or carpooling or walking and biking, and that if we measure everything in, as if we want it to be an expressway, that that's going to have major implications on our downtown roads and our community roads. We don't actually want them to be expressways. We have different expectations for them. And your support was really extraordinary. So everyone that participated, I, I cannot thank you enough, you were, you were mentioned explicitly in the rulemaking itself, specifically on the greenhouse gas measures. Uh, the rule pointed out that 91,000 citizens, nine state DOTs, 24 MPOs, 19 U.S. Senators, 48 members of the House, and over 100 cities. They said numerous local officials, because there are too many, hundreds of businesses and public interest groups reached out on the greenhouse gas rule. And uh, next up, it pointed out that we, not just us, but uh, the American Heart Association and others had gotten tens of thousands of commenters to point out that this rule should not be so vehicle focused. And, and FHWA heard that, and they made changes. So specifically, some of the changes we were looking for were to address person hours of delay, not vehicle hours of delay. That way, a community that was moving more people on a congested roadway through transit, through carpooling, um, would be a higher priority to address than one that was not only just moving single occupancy vehicles, but maybe even favoring single occupancy vehicles that uh, there would be more priority put on those roadways that were experiencing delay with lots of people experiencing it rather than just single occupancy vehicles. To allow uh, states and MPOs to use occupancy data to support that, um, we asked for a non-single occupancy vehicle mode share. Um, we asked that, that uh, there was a rule under freight that would look at freight vehicle delay on the interstate, but it created a higher threshold for uh, freight congestion than for the congestion that people were facing. And we pointed out that it would be nearly impossible for a transportation planner to have two different standards for different vehicles on the exact same roadway. So they, uh, we asked for that to be vacated. Um, we asked for, uh, there was a measure dealing with um, uh, peak hour uh, delay versus, so there was a congestion measure that was looking at, um, at what was happening at peak hours. There was a reliability measure that was looking at whether or not your travel this morning is similar to tomorrow morning and the morning after that. And then they added the, uh, the delay measure, calling it a reliability measure, that looked at the slowest time of day, peak hour, versus the middle of the night. And for those that do not follow our blog, I uh, encourage you to go look at the reams of materials we have put out there about why not only that is 
foolish and puts us in the uh, moves us towards the wrong objective, but that is a completely impossible standard. That the notion that we will ever create a roadway system where people move equally as fast when everybody's on the roadway as they do when nobody's on the roadway is just silliness. Um, and as a result uh, of all the people speaking out on what I will just point out is incredibly technical and sometimes boring uh, transportation geekdom, it really worked. And, and all the outreach you all did really, really was I impactful. So let's jump into the rules themselves. I have a few slides here uh, that, that point out the, the measure area and the performance measures that are required. Um, the uh, first one are the pavement and bridge conditions. And as I said, we're not going to spend a whole lot of time on this. These are the same measures that were proposed. Uh, percentage of pavements on the interstate system in good condition and in poor condition. Percentage of pavement on the non-interstate NHS in good condition and poor condition. And the same thing for NHS bridges. Moving on to the next slide. Um, uh, the Interstate travel time reliability measure and uh, non-interstate travel time reliability measure are the, the, quote, performance measures. So this is the notion of whether or not your trip today will be similar to your trip tomorrow. Um, and then there is also a freight reliability measure uh, as part of the freight standard. Moving on to the next measure, um, under the CMAC program, there is an, a peak hour excessive delay measure, but it is looking at the number of uh, people in a vehicle. It's not just looking at the vehicles themselves. And it's uh, going to be based on uh, whether or not people are going slower than 60% of the uh, posted speed limit. Um, when they are going slower than 60% of the uh, uh, posted speed limit, uh, that will be considered excessively delayed. Um, and they will also need to measure total emissions reductions under the CMAC rule. So let's talk about some of the changes to the rules. Um, one is, as I mentioned before, they changed the focus of reliability from the percentage of mileage to the percentage of impacted travelers. So it's a much more person-focused measure as opposed to a road-focused measure. Um, they dropped the peak hour travel time measure, the, the old TTI measure that we have spent years criticizing. They added a greenhouse gas measure under the uh, uh, highway performance measure, so they, they actually have a, a relatively large section that talks about part of the performance of the roadway includes um, environmental performance. They, uh, they changed the excessive delay measure to person hours of delay and not vehicle hours of delay. They added a non-SOV mode share measure, which is something we specifically requested. They expanded the scope of the CMAC measures to include areas over 200,000 in population. And uh, they committed to taking another look at the measures in 2018 based on the information that they pulled in from folks uh, uh, implementing the measure over the next couple of years. So I'm going to move on from there and, and talk about some of the implementation dates. Um, the safety measures are handled slightly differently than the other measures. Um, the safety measures will be implemented starting on August 31st, 2017, where states and MPOs will have to report their first sets of targets for the safety measures. Um, on August 31st, 2019, two years later, there will be an assessment of the progress where states will be expected to report on whether or not they have um, addressed uh, their targets and reached their targets. Uh, if they have not, they'll be expected to redo their targets. And then uh, in December of 2019, uh, FHWA will do a formal assessment of their progress. The other measures have a slower timeline. Uh, on October 1st of 2017, there will be applicability determinations done. Those applicability determinations will be particularly for CMAC to see whether or not your area has to do some of the CMAC measures which is based on whether or not your area is in non-attainment or not. 
uh, on October 1st of 2018, your first targets need to be reported. Um, so that's a year later than safety. Um, on October 1st, 2020, states will report on their progress and, uh, and then soon thereafter, or, uh, sorry, two years after that, 2022, FHWA will assess uh, the progress. Okay, so that's uh, a whole lot of dates and information. Um, I do want to point out to folks that uh, you should visit FHWA's uh, Transportation Performance Management website, which is uh, truly outstanding. They've, they've put a ton of materials up there that are very useful. Um, they have all the information and the rulemakings themselves. They have um, tools that will allow you to assess your agency's level of performance management ability um, to you, uh, give you ideas on how to use practical tools to move your agency to the next level of performance management. And they will be announcing training opportunities and workshops uh, hopefully this summer to help folks in the implementation of the rule. Um, they're also expected to put out several guidebooks, and one of the guidebooks that uh, are I'd like to point out is one that uh, our partner organization, Smart Growth America, put out called Why and How to Measure Access to Opportunity. This is an excellent guidebook uh, that, that gives it people information about which communities are already measuring access to opportunity, particularly jobs access, um, which looks at how many people live within 45 minutes, generally, of, uh, of a certain number of jobs and not just within 45 minutes, but 45 minutes, not just by car, but by uh, walking, transit, biking, et cetera. Um, and it, it includes tools and data and uh, general resources on, on how others can do uh, similar measures. FHWA, as I understood it, was planning to uh, issue some new guidelines on a transportation investment strategy analysis, on target setting coordination between states and MPOs, and on general analytical tools to support transportation performance management. So keep your eyes out for those. Uh, transportation for America also has done some work on uh, uh, transportation performance management. Um, over the last year, we've been involved in a, a federal highways funded transportation leadership academy with seven MPOs. Uh, those MPOs were Des Moines, Iowa, Cleveland, Ohio, South Bend, and Indianapolis, Indiana, uh, Boston, Massachusetts, Seattle, Washington, and Lee County, Florida. And we not only looked at best practices for performance management, but ways to measure areas that go beyond the federal rules and how to implement it in a way that uh, changes your investment decisions to create the, the, the best, most effective list of, of uh, spending priorities that support your, your performance goals. Um, we are also involved in uh, a deeper dive with Massachusetts MPOs, which are known as RPAs there, um, which is funded by the Barr Foundation, and we will be uh, doing uh, a deep dive with them. But coming in February 2017 uh, will be new technical assistance opportunities for MPOs that are interested in going through similar trainings to the ones we did through the FHWA-funded Transportation Leadership Academy. Renata, do you want to talk about being a T4A member? Yes. So Transportation for America has a wonderful membership program. We are dedicated to providing you with updated information, more in-depth information, uh, such as on the performance measure rule. Uh, the rule was over 300 pages. Our members will be getting a summary broken down on what this means to them specifically in their area. Um, and that's just sort of um, the information the membership program provides. Um, we're really excited to be bringing this information to you all. So now we're going to move forward with the question and answer portion of today's webinar. So that's the first question we have today. What are the consequences if one does not meet these measures? So that's a very, very good question. Uh, frankly, the consequences are not very steep. Um, it, there are some minor consequences on the safety and the system uh, condition measures. Uh, if you don't meet your self-set targets, um, you basically have to spend as much as you would have spent in those areas as of 2009. <laughs> 
So just to give you a little context on what the heck that means, um, there were individual bridge maintenance programs and interstate maintenance programs before MAP 21. And they consolidated those programs into broad-based programs. And it, one of the compromises, like I said, was to, they would create this performance management system. What they're saying is we want to ensure that the spending for bridge doesn't fall below those levels pre-consolidation. So I, I would imagine there are very few states that are actually spending less than that but you would lose your flexibility to take money out of those categories and you would have to dedicate it. Uh, in my opinion, the biggest impact of uh, this rule is just that everyone has to be much more uh, forthright about what the current spending levels buy, about how much you can really accomplish with it, about what the priorities for the region should be and are, and uh, it will allow folks to look at, so if you say I'm going to uh, get rid of all deficient bridges, so there will be 100% uh, of my NHS bridges in good condition and none in poor condition, but you're not funding the replacement of any bridges, it's going to allow people to call, to, to call the question of whether or not you're serious about those targets. It will allow people to engage and say I don't, I don't believe that that is the case. I think the good news for the agencies is you now get to talk to the public about what is doable with the money you're being given. And if they really, for example, want there to be no deficient bridges, but they also want you to address capacity issues, you can show them in very stark detail uh, how much the current funding actually buys towards all of those goals and how sometimes they fight one another. Great. So we had a follow-up question to that on bridge condition measures. Are those currently structural or do they include whether a bridge provides multimodal support? Bridges are important since they are pinch points which can dissuade bikeheads if they feel unsafe. Yes, that is a very, very, very good question. No, the rules do not follow, uh, do not address those sorts of issues. Uh, it might possibly be caught by um, the bike ped safety numbers just because uh, since they create those pinch points, people might be sent in, well, they, they, it might be more dangerous because of that, you might have more fatalities, but there is no measure right now about the connectivity for uh, non-motorized travelers. That would be something that you would need to add if you want to make sure it's measured as part of the system. An additional question. So when do I need to start working on this? Yes, um, the, and we will put up a, a version of this. I, I will uh, apologize. We got very last minute news from Federal Highways that they could not participate and uh, have been trying very last minute to update the information uh, appropriately. So we will share with everybody the PowerPoint um, uh, up to date and corrected and it has a graph that shows um, the, the, the important implementation dates for the measures. Um, for safety, you all will have to report safety targets of, uh, on August 31st of this year. So you, are, you should go into that safety rule, which has been out for a while now, um, and uh, start making targets for uh, what you want to do to the fatality rate, to the um, uh, serious injury rate. Uh, and to overall fatalities and serious injuries as well as bike ped fatalities. Um, in terms of the other measures, uh, you will have to set your first targets by October 1st of 2018. So you have some time before those first targets are actually due. Um, and there, as I mentioned, I do expect Federal Highways to have some technical assistance and guidance out uh, this summer to help you all determine the best way to set those, uh, those targets. Great. So we have a participant who believes access to jobs is very important and they have two questions. The first question, how is access measured? For example, what tool and how does the treat time to park vehicle or time walk to transit? No. Very good question. Um, 
A lot of times in transportation, we make the assumption that we are measuring origin to destination trips. We almost never do that in transportation. None of our congestion measures look at where people start or end. Um, even the measures in this don't. Um, when we talk about, quote, trip time, unquote, uh, for congestion measures, it is not from where you started and where you ended. It is from where there is a sensor on one side and a sensor on another side. It is nobody's origin and destination. So um, one of the things people are often surprised to realize is how little of that information we analyze at all. But when we try to do new measures, we try to get it perfect, exactly right, in spite of the fact that we're not getting it perfect or exactly right in any area that we have been measuring for decades. Um, so when people are measuring access to jobs, sometimes it is a relatively blunt measure where they're looking simply at how many jobs are located within a 45-minute travel shed. And is it perfect? No. If you're, if you're asking to know the correct answer, like it's a pop quiz, on how many jobs are accessible within 45 minutes, that is not an achievable number. If you are looking to see the trend for your area, whether or not more jobs are becoming accessible within a similar period of time, there's a lot of information out there that can help you see whether or not you are improving the trend. And that is what we tend to do in transportation. While we don't measure whether or not your trip time from home to work uh, was changed by a congestion relief measure, we really only measure, like I said, whether or not your trip time was improved between two sensors. We assume that if your trip time between those sensors was improved, that your overall trip time was probably improved as well. Um, I will say we are getting much better in this area, and the introduction of cell phone data is allowing us to be a lot more detailed and explicit while no, in fact, almost nobody uses it yet, there's a, a bonanza out there. And uh, our partners over at SSTI have been using uh, some of that data to look at origin and destination uh, data for bicyclists and pedestrians and, uh, and been getting some very interesting information out of that. So I think as we go forward, because d data is becoming uh, much better and much easier to access, we will see an improvement on some of those issues like parking time and, uh, and walking time on either side of a transit trip. That's probably not what you're going to get now, but it doesn't mean that what you're going to get will not be useful for transportation decision making. Great. And then the second part to that question was, what's the me what measurement is available for access to things besides jobs? For example, stores, churches, parks. Very, very good question. Uh, there is, again, becoming increasing levels of information out there. One of the groups that we have partnered with a couple of times is uh, City Labs. They have an, a tool called Sugar Access, and they look not just at the number of jobs that are located nearby. They use GIS to look at other important sites like groceries, like uh, schools and daycare and medical facilities. They also have a way of measuring it that doesn't just look at what is within 45 minutes. It, it weights those uh, important destinations that are closer over the ones that are farther. So an area that has, you know, let's say 20,000 jobs, but they're all exactly 45 minutes away, would not get as good of an evaluation or score as an area that has those same 20,000 jobs scattered throughout the area so that you have some that are five minutes away and some that are 45 minutes away. So they, they look at that kind of degradation of value as it gets further and further out. There's also a, a, bit, a much steeper degradation of value in sites that are not work-related. So people will travel 45 minutes for a job. There are very few people that are going to travel 45 minutes for a grocery. And if they're having to travel 45 minutes for a grocery, that is a rather extreme version of a, of a, a food desert. So uh, there's an acknowledgement or recognition that different trips are, are, uh, should be different lengths. And uh, it, it's important to remember that most trips are not actually work-related while we do tend to overfocus on the commute trip because uh, that simplifies things and makes it much easier on us. Great. Another question. Given the new administration's position on climate change, is the third performance rule at risk of revision or repeal due to its inclusion of a GHD performance measure? 
Yeah, that's a very good question. And uh, I have uh, the incredibly unhelpful answer of I don't know. Um, it's possible. Uh, I would say that the way the methods that the new administration could use to go after that portion of the rule are they could start an entirely new rulemaking to strip this out, but that would take some time. They could uh, knock down the entire rule, but there's a lot in this rule that people like. So I'd be kind of surprised if uh, their decision was to, to just get rid of it in its entirety. Um, or they could add a rider to a bill, an appropriations bill maybe, that says that USDOT could do nothing to enforce that section of the bill or of the, that section of the rule. Um, I, could that happen? Absolutely. If I were trying to hit the CO2 measure, I would do the, the last option. I'd try to add a rider and just focus on that, that bar part. But it still exists out there, and as soon as that rider goes away, it goes back into power. So um, it doesn't have the permanency that someone truly opposed to addressing climate change might, uh, might want. Um, I'd also say that if you've seen the list of rules and regs and um, you know, various measures that um, some folks on the right want to go after, uh, they have a lot bigger fish to fry than a measure that requires states to set a target, which could be a negative target. So the state of North Dakota could say we are currently emitting, um, you know, I, I don't even know, like X million tons of CO2 in the air, and we're going to now emit, you know, 50% more tons. And that's fine. That's, they, could, they, could say that, they could say that their goal for safety is for it to get worse. You're allowed to do that, too. Um, it's going to be unpleasant if you say something like that. Your press will probably call you on that, but you can. And on CO2, they can say, we're just going to let the CO2 emissions go up. And if we do meet our target or don't meet our target, all we have to do is then, in four years, set a new target, and then we get four more years to address it. And then at the end of that, it's not clear what happens. So if I'm looking to spend my political capital, I'm probably going to go after much more stringent, difficult regulations than this one. Thanks, Beth. So as we noted earlier, we will be sending you all information on today's webinar. We'll be sending you and pointing you to resources that we have around the rule. Beth, any closing remarks to the participants on the webinar today? Um, we are in a time of great flux. And so things are changing on an almost hourly basis. We will do our very best to keep you up to date on what's going on. Um, but it, it would be uh, to your benefit to start digging through these rules and what they want for you to do and looking at FHWA's tools that are online um, in, in the very near future because web, this overall rule is very unlikely that it's truly going to be delayed and particularly those safety measures, there's no one that's going to say, no, we don't need to measure safety. So it's time to start setting those targets, time to start moving forward on performance management. And uh, if you want further help, uh, just reach out to us. We're, we're enthusiastic to do so. Thank you, everyone.